Welcome to The Backstory. I'm your host, Ann Hancock-Toomey. Over the course of my career, I've had the privilege to work with and learn from and guide some incredible leaders, mostly in healthcare, but not always. The Backstory is a chance for me to talk to some of them, unpack who they are and where they came from, and, and how it all influences who they are today and how they lead. Ultimately, each conversation offers a case study in what I'm calling authentic leadership. Let me now invite you into our conversation for The Real Backstory. Today, I have the great pleasure of spending time with Bill Southwick, entrepreneur, three-time healthcare CEO, the guy that many refer to as the physician whisperer, and somebody that I've admired for a long time. Welcome to The Backstory, Bill. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Honored to be here. Awesome. Bill, you are known in Nashville for your great success over the last 25 years, taking fledgling and sometimes underperforming companies and making them great. I think most recently, you have left your post as CEO of Qualderm, and you're now on the board there. But Qualderm is one of the nation's largest dermatology platforms. 160 physician practices across 17 states, largely that you built. Congratulations on that. And I uh, understand that you sold the company to new investors last year. We did. Yeah. Bay Pine bought into the company last year, combining Pinnacle Dermatology and Qualderm. And quite proud of it. We're very strong here in Middle Tennessee and have great relationships with our providers. So hopefully that'll continue to give us the impetus for growth. Very good. And so now you've got a little time on your hands as you figure out what is the next chapter of your storied career. And I'm grateful to have a little time with you in this window where you've got a little more time on your hands. So I would say, Bill, that you know a thing or two about what it takes to write ships, to build culture, to align the the interests of opinionated stakeholders. You certainly know what it takes to grow and scale an enterprise. And this is a podcast, of course, about unpacking what it takes to be the kind of leader that people want to follow, the kind of leader who is a multiplier of talent because of the way that you choose to show up and the way you choose to lead and the environment that you create for others. I'm excited to dig in with you a little bit to learn about you. Good. Happy to do it and appreciate that kind of introduction. I'll take it. (laughs) All right. So you've had a long and successful career in healthcare and beyond, but you had to start somewhere and it wasn't in healthcare and it wasn't in Nashville. In fact, you're a New Yorker. Um, So talk a little bit about growing up and where you came from and how you grew up. Yeah, I wouldn't say that where I grew up was the pathway to being here. Certainly, I grew up in a small town called Shelter Island, New York, and most people don't know where that is, although that's growing. But it's an island off of Long Island that you can only get to by ferry boat. Hmm. So there's no tunnels, bridges, or anything else. So it was a very good place to grow up in terms of safe. My parents, I think, liked it because everybody knew everybody else, and you pretty much could say, I can send my kid off on a bike, and that's not a problem. But yeah, I graduated from a public high school, 19 kids in my class, 250 in kindergarten through 12th grade. So (laughs) you got to know everybody pretty well. Yeah, I guess you do. Very good. Did you grow up with siblings? I did. I have a younger brother who's about five years younger than I am. Okay. And what did you want to be when you grew up? A golf pro. Really? I played competitive golf growing up, so I I was quite sure I was going to be good enough to do that. Went to college and started playing golf there with a bunch of guys who kept a statistic on every single shot, every single thought process, and I started wondering whether I had the dedication to make it work at that level, and it turns out I wasn't so sure about that, so I decided to pivot and study economics. Ah, okay. So what, from your early days of playing competitive golf, would you say you've carried with you into your career that has been a lesson that stayed with you? Uh, It's an awesome sport for individual development because it is you. It's all on you. And my wife's a big tennis player. She played tennis in college, and she likes to say, how could it be so hard to hit a ball that's just sitting there? (laughs) So the mental aspect of the game is pretty strong. Competition, one-on-one. You really have to stay focused. You have to stay in that moment. And that teaches you a lot about yourself and about your ability to handle pressure. And you grow from that. You might not know it at the time, but you grow from that. You develop a sense of confidence to say, I could repeat this. Do you still play? I do. Not very often. 
Okay. Yeah. Back isn't what it used to be. Tell me about your first job and maybe one thing that you learned from that. Yeah, my first job was straight out of college after I finished my degree in economics and finance, and I went straight into financial planning. Okay. I decided that managing money sounded like a glamorous career. I didn't have any, so it meant managing others. So I went into that business with the hope to learn a lot about business finance and develop that. And it was really rewarding. I worked with family businesses that were a significant size, but pretty much cash poor. And it was a question of how to do family business succession, how to plan and invest, how to manage taxes. So that was it was a great experience, and you were handed a phone book and a phone and say, go after it and find clients, and that's pretty humbling, I'll say that. I didn't expect that. I thought, if I know this stuff, people should come to me. Yeah, that is really tough and probably made you a great developer of business and f- relationship builder later right. in your career. Relationship, for sure. Yeah. Tell me about the first leader that you can remember. It could be a teacher. It could be a leader of a Boy Scout troop. It could be a parent. But who who stands out to you as someone that you really admired, who impacted you in a positive way? I'd say there's two people. One was my dad. Mm -hmm. Certainly taught me the ethics of hard work, taught me there's nothing that you deserve. It comes to you through the Mm -hmm. effort. And that was... A lesson I learned, he was his own business uh, entrepreneur himself. He owned an insurance agency on the island. So he had to develop relationships. He had to be there. And he was the one that put in that early sense of the person in front of you is always more important than the person calling you. Those kinds of little lessons that carry through with you to understand and create a self-awareness about yourself and how you carry yourself among others. And then um, I remember I used to think that everything you did had to be at the beginning. It had to be, you had to earn that success at that particular moment. This cause and effect had to be immediate. It's not immediate, not by any stretch of the matter. So one of the gentlemen that I worked with in financial planning, his name is Lloyd Rawls, and I had planned this whole day for us to be together in about two of the meetings that were probably one of our most important meetings just blew out, canceled, happens. And he could tell I was depressed. And he just looked at me and said, don't worry about it. You'll get paid for today. You just don't know when. And I thought that was a good line that stuck with me forever. That's a great line. Yeah, we talk about planting seeds a lot, right? Right. That oftentimes you nurture over time, but you never know when they're actually going to grow. Absolutely. Okay, so you... You didn't start your career in healthcare. Obviously, you started in financial planning. Talk about some of those early career stops and sort of decisions before you got into healthcare. Yeah, I was in Florida for a while in financial planning and enjoyed that. I went to school down there, so I stayed there. Mm-hmm. Thought that was better than the weather in New York. But apparently, something was calling me back, so I went back to New York in 1990, made a decision to open up my own firm there. And if you remember anything about those days, the nice fat recession happened. So it was not the best time to start a financial services firm. So I found myself having to pivot, deal with life insurance, deal with more immediate need things. And so you had to use a lesson in adapting. How do you survive first so you can thrive later? And that was really a key aspect of it. Very good. And then how did you get into healthcare? What lured you? What lured me was, like a lot of guys, I moved here in 1996, and anybody that you met here that was uh, a peer, that was another business guy that wasn't from Nashville, we all had one thing in common. We all had wives from Nashville. Mm -hmm. So my, my wife, Leah, wanted to come back to Nashville, I could tell. Eastern Long Island was great for a long time, but then the first child came, and it just wasn't the place we decided we wanted to raise our daughter or daughters now that we have two. And so moved back. I had a bit, one of my clients was a gentleman by the name of Woody Miller, who was in the surgery center business and was a co-founder with Joel Gordon in the surgery center business, surgical care affiliates. And he just kept after me saying, you belong here and getting into healthcare. I decided, why not? It sounded like a great opportunity to leverage the knowledge I had, the ability to work with others who had been there, done that, Mm -hmm. and to learn from them sounded appealing. So down in 1996, we came. 
Very good. And so did you join surgical care affiliates at that time? I did not. Actually, they just recently exited that business. HealthSouth bought it. Okay. But they bought the business at that time, and we started a company called Women's Health Partners, which was my first step into the physician practice management world. That was a version 1.0 of physician practice management? <laughs> yeah, 1.0. Yeah, started in 96. And I was the first employee. I was the chief development officer. So out and about I went. And I think I knew more people in all the periphery cities around Nashville than I did in Nashville because I was gone so much. Fair enough. Well, okay, so then from there, your career really took off. And you were the CEO of three different healthcare ventures over, I guess, from that point in time in the late 90s until just very recently. Talk a little bit about each one of those, the companies that they were, sort of the trajectory of them under your leadership, and maybe what you carry with you from those days. Sure. Healthmark Partners was the surgery center company mm-hmm. that we ended up running. No no surprise there because we pivoted. Physician practice management 1.0 didn't work out exactly as everybody had planned. And as a <laughs> result, we needed to pivot. Our relationships with our providers, our physicians, was strong enough that we could rebuild the company from practice management all the way to a surgery center company partnering with those same physicians. So a great lesson in relationships and building trust and credibility. So we had to redevelop talent. We had to remake the company. We had to restructure the capital structure Mm -hmm. of the the business. So it was a big lesson over a 15-year period of time of starting in one business Mm -hmm. and ending up in another with the same tax ID number. So that taught me about everything I needed to know at that point, or so I thought. What would you say are the necessary ingredients to being able to make that kind of transformation, bringing along great talent that could have left you to go other places? Yeah, exactly. Uh, So it was really about addressing that talent directly and saying, I know you're doing this, but I also know you can do that because you're the kind of person that can figure that out. And in addition to that, just building that culture of what do we want to be? And everybody started to buy into the fact that we could transition this to that, and that would be exciting. And as they did that, it wasn't easy. We made mistakes along the way. We had certainly challenges we didn't see coming, but the culture and the people really made the difference. And that was a great lesson in that if you're going to develop people that have a lot of talent, you can pivot them in many different directions. And when you do that... That makes them more marketable, but it also created a trust level, a loyalty level where they didn't leave, even though you were making them more marketable. So that was a, I took a big lesson from that. Develop your people and they will be loyal and they will shift talents and not disappoint. It's difficult to make the transformation that you did. And we find that you have to paint a picture for the context for change, right? Why is what we have been doing maybe quite well untenable? given the market conditions, and then painting a picture at the same time of what could be, even if you don't fully know what that picture will be. But then that inspiration of this is what we could build together, and I believe I want you in uh, maybe a little bit of a different seat on the bus, but here's how we'll get there together, and then doing that arm in arm. That's something that, you know, being in the foxhole with folks does create a lot of loyalty and a lot of trust quickly. Yeah, it really does. You have to have some humor with it. I told one of our employees who ran a practice and said, hey, I can't run a surgery center. I said, yeah, you can. I said, they practically run themselves, <laughs> knowing that was far That's from not the true. case. That's not true. But I figured by the time he learned that, that he would be deep enough into it, that he would have that confidence. And sure enough, he turned out to be one of our best. Well, the best leaders oftentimes see what's possible in someone else that they can't see in themselves. And it sounds like you're that kind of leader. Hopefully. Tell me where you went from there. So after we sold Healthmark, we worked together with USPI for a while. Really liked the people, but I wasn't going to move to Dallas. And here was more maintenance mode. I like to be a growth guy and Mm -hmm. take on challenges. So found a company through a mutual friend by the name of Redoc, and that was an electronic medical records business in physical, occupational, and speech therapy. And it just seemed interesting. It was a challenge. I was no healthcare IT expert, but I said, Let's go. It was um, had a lot of messy HR issues within it, and it also had some quite, I guess, a culture that was very siloed, very divisional. And uh, I'm doing my job, but they're not doing their job. So first thing I did was attack that. Went offsite. We had some hard discussions across the table and decided who was on the bus and who wasn't. And uh, once we got rolling on that and fixed that, we got some of the biggest and best names in healthcare and hospital management and. 
off we went to the races. Again, couldn't accomplish it without a team that believed in that. Knew they could get there. We just had to figure out which ones believed that and which ones were willing to work with others. We just developed a credo of got your back. We used to sign emails, GYB. Really? Yeah. I love that. Can I steal that? Sure. I might. Sure. And that's a real success story, Redoc. Uh, yeah, we, we uh, ran that company. Uh, it was, like I said, it was a turnaround. Uh, we, were, we had to change our go-to-market strategy, the quality and content of our software, uh, and then really the structure and how we uh, sold the product. Uh, it was a good product. It did a lot of good. We could prove that. And really what we did was we went out and told hospitals, Look, everybody comes and tells you a software story about rate of return, and they're from phenomenal numbers. And the first thing you say, well, that's probably not true. So we shifted, and we went to a strategy that said, I only need to be 20% because the math worked out that way, about 19 or 20% mm -hmm. for you to break even on this. Believe it or not, that ended up being a huge success because most people are fearful of making that decision to say, how am I going to go off with this one-off company and bank on this great rate of return? So it was an easier story to say, if you're 20% right, you break even. I like it. You simplified the complex. Tried to, yeah. Just, yeah, that's most of what business is about. Yeah, and didn't overpromise, which I think you're right. There's a lot of that. <laughs> So you left Redoc and you found yourself back in physician land working with Qualderm, which I don't believe it was called Qualderm at the time. But talk nope. about that transition back. And was that intentional? Did you want to get back into more of the physician practice management world? Is that sort of where your heart is? No. It was not <laughs> a funny story. I thought after the first time I did it, it was a difficult time, as you remember, that yeah. 1.0 didn't go exceedingly well. And we were in a business where it just felt like it's like being at a dance when the music stopped. And mm -hmm. we're like, oh, now we got to remake this whole company. So Redoc was a great success. We were able to sell that company. We didn't want to do it, but it made sense for all the people involved in the company. So we sold that. And again, didn't want to transition, didn't want to move to the city where this company that purchased us was based. I just got a call from some folks at Cressy and Company, Ralph Davis, longtime guy here mm -hmm. in Nashville yeah, Healthcare. And so we just chatted about the business that they were in, struggling a little bit on relationships, some key aspects mm -hmm. of what makes business practice the practice management business hum. And we chatted about it and I just kind of said, well, I think you need to make a few changes or do a few things. I won't go into the detail of that, but I literally said, and I'm not angling for this job. Time went on. There was some unfortunate circumstances around that business at the time that caused some government intervention that all of a sudden threw things into a little bit of a dis disruptive pattern. Being the guy who's up for a challenge and maybe not smart enough to recognize how big the challenge is. Or a glutton for punishment. Yeah, know? either way, yeah. <laughs> I agreed to go back into practice management. And, you know, in my view, it was helping out. I really enjoy, I think, the success of any business is you're not working for yourself as much as you're working for others, others in the business, other the, others that believed in your story, buying your product, buying right. your service. And it was an opportunity to go help in a situation where they probably didn't deserve the position they were in, but nonetheless, they were in it. Mm -hmm. So assessed what needed to go on, took the company from about $33 million in revenue to $8 million in revenue in six months. And everybody would oh, say, wow. well, how did you keep your job doing that? It was just a necessary process. Yeah of revamping the team, revamping the partners, and getting it in a place where it was what we wanted it to be. We renamed the company Qualderm and pivoted to that. And we said, if we're going to be about quality, which is what we said we were going to be about, we're going to put it in our name. That way we'll be 10 times as embarrassed if we don't live up to it. I like it. We put put the onus stake, on ourselves. Yeah, put yeah. a stake in the ground. So you had to shrink to grow. Yes. We had to That's get... a really hard concept for leaders, I think, and certainly for investors. So how did you how did you manage up while also managing sort of the transformation of this company in a different way? Yeah, that's a good question. I wish I could remember every single aspect of that, but it became apparent that we were going to be stuck. The issues that occurred were reputationally very damaging, mm -hmm. and we needed to change and we needed to say, if this is what we're going to be about, what do we need to change? We need to change the structure, the partnership, and who we partner with and why. And so we did that. 
it would and I'll give credit to Cressy and Company who was the investor at the time they understood that and they decided that selling the original business back separating from some partners that had these issues wasn't going to allow us to grow probably good for both sides not necessarily good for Cressy because buying things selling things back quickly after you've bought them is usually not a good financial yeah. result but we had a vision we saw all right this is what we could do and we could build off of certain partners that we thought exemplified what we were all about in terms of quality, in terms of being careful and thoughtful about what you do. Because we weren't immune to the idea of things could go well or things could go poorly, but reputationally, it was all about how do we establish that? And how can we reverse something that was in a position where we weren't that well thought of to somebody we could be thought of as one of the best? And it's we accomplished really, really hard to do you realize you were probably, so close to yeah, it you probably didn't even recognize right. it right you're in the you're yeah. in it and you're dealing with it and you're focused on it and you're and, and you you recognize that the partners who deserve that relationship and that reputation mm-hmm. you work for that that's what motivates you to do it so that's we jumped into it we had to revamp a lot of the team i think we were left with maybe two of the original team brought in a bunch of people who lived that, thought that, and we were fortunate enough, we came up with a strong mission, vision, value day one, and we always stuck to it, tested ourselves often. Are we living up to this? And it's a big success story. My goodness. (laughs) (laughs) How long did it take? Eight years. Okay. So you did physician practice management 1.0. And then you got back in because you're we've established you're a glutton for punishment. 2.0. <laughs> yeah. People call you the physician whisperer. Why do you think that's your reputation, your brand? Well, I'm proud of the reputation if that's true. But I, I think we just decided that physicians make very good decisions if they have the time, resources, and partners to develop the thesis around the decision to be made, the why. And so much of the time, the heavy lifting of you do research, you guys post things out there. Most people don't understand all the work that goes into getting that out there. It's the same thing in practice management. There's all this work at developing this relationship with them to say, you're going to be able to do what you do best. That's what we're going to free you up to do. Outside of that, we're going to take care of this. But along the way, we're going to share with you every step of the way, why we're doing that. Mm-hmm. This is our thought process. You don't have to think of us as the people that are going to tell you what to do. We're going to decide that together. And we even had partnerships where the physicians were the majority owners. People mm-hmm. thought we were nuts. And go, why are you doing that? We never had any issues or disputes because our board meetings were clear. This is what we're doing. This is our end goal. This is how we're measuring the success we're having, patient satisfaction, quality indicators or whatever. All those things mattered, and the physicians just built a natural trust because they realize you're not out for yourself. You're out for them as much as anything else, and more importantly, you're out for the patient. All this cliche-type talk that occurs, but if you walk the walk on that, Mm -hmm. physicians respect that. And they know they can count on you, as you can them. The trust built on communication, built on a breaking promises, or when you have to pivot and go a different direction, just being clear about it, being transparent, right. walking together arm in arm, as opposed to being on the other side of the table from each other. Right. It's There's going to be good news and there's going to be bad news, and you just got to share them both yep. early. I think one of those early stages of learning is bad news doesn't get better with time. <laughs> so deal with it now. That is very true. <laughs> So uh, you have had an incredible career. What are you most proud of? I'm most proud of the people I developed, the people that developed themselves with my help and guidance. They did it, but I just helped them along the way. And now they sit in CFO seats. They sit in CEO seats. They sit in CTO seats. So it was really about seeing the potential in people that you could say, I know what they're capable of. They have all these self-doubts. I know what that's like. I sat there. Mm -hmm. I lived that. It was the same kind of thing. Maybe I was a little less savvy than they were in terms of understanding what I could or couldn't do. I just said, let's jump. What's the worst that could happen? That's uh, 
a great thing to be proud of, to have maximized these individuals, to have seen the potential and then nurtured the potential that you saw in them that they didn't see in themselves. And now they've gone on to be really successful. That's really what it's all about, right? It's hugely gratifying. We've talked about authentic leadership and sort of the traits of being an authentic leader. And one of those traits, of course, is admitting your mistakes and talking about them openly so that you create an environment where others aren't afraid to take risk, right? And are not afraid to make mistakes and then certainly to learn from them, to grow from them. Can you think of a a mistake or two that you made over the years? That'd be another podcast. (laughs) Yeah, plenty. I'd say that We became very good at buying and developing surgery centers, buying them uh, troubled assets and fixing them. So much so that I probably thought we could fix anything. Mm -hmm. There's some things that reputationally or just quality team, they become too hard. Mm -hmm. Made a mistake one time buying a surgery center based on Yes, it was troubled. Everybody knew that. It was pretty clear, but it was such a compelling price. Like, how could I fail? Which, what I learned by that, from that, was we didn't fail on the asset. We did turn it around, but the opportunity cost of that was enormous. It was taxing on the team because some of the quality control members of my team were like, are you really sure we want to do this? Which was their way of saying, don't do this. And we bought that asset, and I think the day we bought it or the day after, the state inspectors come in. Mm. We didn't even have time to fix what was wrong. But it was embarrassing, and it was like, no matter the price and believing what we can do, there's some decisions that you just need to pass on. A friend of yours and mine, Gene Fleming, used to always tell me, if you make a bad decision, you get to live it every month when you see the financials. And that was a, I learned that. Not only did he say it and I listened to it, but I was able to make my mistake and learn directly what he meant by it. How did you handle that with your team? Did you all talk about it? Did you talk about what you learned from it? We did. Yeah, we sat around and talked about, okay, we're in this. we got to fix this. Mm -hmm. So the good news is we had relationships within the team that people weren't going to sit there and say, Bill, that was the dumbest thing you could have ever done. They turned around and said, all right, we have to do is we're in this. We're going to fix this. We're going to make sure that reputationally what was important to us is what we achieve here. And we did that to a large extent. There was some issues that lagged on for longer than we'd like for them to have lagged on, but we got there. We got it to a point where, again, we were happy to have that asset, but it was just a mistake day one. So learn from that. But the incredible part was the team never beat into anybody or anything, including me. This was a bad decision. He just said, all right, now we have to fix it. And it was almost a challenge to prove the state wrong on the inspection to say, okay, everything you said, we agree with. We're going to fix it, and here's how we're going to do it, and the time frame in which we're going to do it. And we did it, but it was the team that did it, and they didn't run. They jumped in. Absolutely. Think about leaders who you admire, and what would you summarize are the traits of the most effective leaders? We've talked about some of the things that you have done in your career, the characteristics that um, are inherent to your leadership style. And so I, I would hope some of those would make the list. But I'm curious how you think about what makes for the most effective leaders. Sure. I guess to sum it up, the ones that we've all seen, to me, exude an inner confidence that probably isn't always there, but it shows to be an inner confidence. And I think it's, what I've learned over the years, I think an effective leader has a higher EQ than an IQ. The humility, the dealing with things in a authentic, genuine fashion, transparency, just no hidden agendas. Mm -hmm. Everybody's trying to reach the same goal. If you can establish where you want to go and how you're going to do it and the way you act to get there, it's not that hard, in my view, to be a good leader. It's the challenges along the way that make you want to say, should I deviate from that? Mm -hmm. Really, no. I mean, do you have to pivot from time to time and make different decisions? Yeah. But ultimately, the ones that I admire the most have show an inner calm. They show a matter of fact, this is what we have to do, and uh, there's going to be extreme highs, extreme lows, ignore both, Mm -hmm. and move on with what you need to do. 
you know, you and I have a mentor, Gene Fleming. He was one of the ones I learned that from. You, know, you just knew where you stood with Gene, and you knew that there was never going to be an overexcitement of, you know, oh my gosh, the sky's falling. There was never going to be a, yeah, there's a celebration of what we did, but at the same time, Very you don't spike the football every yes. time you score a touchdown. It's your job. There you go. Yeah, he's a he's very measured and has taught me so much. He's a calm in the storm, I think, very much for his the teams that he's led and certainly for those he's mentored. And people see that and they start to emulate that. They don't run from challenges or problems and they jump in instead of jump out. Yeah. When you have that kind of leader. What would you say is your greatest gifting as a leader? I think the gift that I've been given is my parents were hugely influential in my life in that you're going to go through some tough times. You're going to go through some times that make you feel like you're bigger than you are. Mm -hmm. Ignore that. You have to be measured in what you do, and there is a right and a wrong way, period. It's not always black and white, but there are things that internally you know when the butterflies happen or the anxiety happens that you're probably going down the wrong path. Think about that. How do you change that? And they taught me how you respect other people. They taught me, no matter who they met or how they dealt with people, they dealt with them the same. Mm -hmm. And we were blessed to be in a place where you could find a state judge and a school janitor playing golf in the same foursome. And everybody, if you treat them the same and you respect them the same, that matters. And so that was probably the gift that was given to me, and it stuck with me. And that's just how I like to run companies or deal with people. Mm -hmm. That's so funny because that's exactly what my father and his father taught me, which is to always treat everyone the same. I come from a very small town and we had a series of hardware stores and you had the CEO of the bank and you had the, the farmer or others and you always treated everybody the same. So that's interesting. We both received that message early in life. Yeah, yeah. it's a gift and that's why you're a good leader. Ah, thank you. All right, we all have Achilles heels and have things that we're working on. And so what's your Achilles heel? What's your blind spot as a leader that maybe you're aware of and you're working on as you think about leading the next team that inevitably you'll be leading? I would do, be I would do better to sit and listen to our teammates more. I would sit longer. I catch myself asking them how they're doing, listening to that story immediately starting to think about the next thing I got to do and do I, how long do I stay here? Those kinds of things. And it, I'm ashamed of it. I'm, this is, don't go in and ask them how they're doing if you don't really want to know. And I did want to know, but it was, it's more along the lines of take the time to know the people, take the time. If they know you care, they're behind you. And I think they do know I care, but I could care more. Active listening, it's an art. It's uh, something I work on as well, so you're not alone. I'm curious how you have managed all the various dimensions of your life and continued to be successful and to be who your work environment needed you to be. I think this is something that every leader, really anyone who has a family and is trying to work and trying to fulfill all the various obligations in their life struggles with on a day-to-day. -day. I'm curious what your view is on that and what you've learned over the years. Yeah, it's a good question because early on, I don't think I was very good at it. I had high expectations, still do, but it's a question of how you manage those and what people think you're expecting. And I think for me, I had to understand, all right, sleep is important. Yeah. Just plain, simple, sleep is important. And I'd like to say I could work all day long on two, three hours of sleep. I can't. I'm not very effective at it. And I have to have a full night's sleep. So the question is how you do that. You got to wear yourself out a bit. So you got to stay active, work out, take care of yourself. So there's no wisdom in any of this. It's just the same old blocking and tackling of I got to eat right. I got to exercise right. I got to sleep right. And how do they sequentially work together? And thinking about that is hard to do when you're, when so many people are relying upon you as a leader. When your company, you think every result is a reflection of you. But it takes a while to mature and get to the point where you realize to be effective, that's how I make a difference. What makes me be effective, or at least half effective? And how do you think about the construct of work-life balance? And maybe how did that evolve as your career evolved? I think 
That is definitionally different with many folks. I'll use the example because I guess my generation now, since I'm older, it was very much work focused. It was very much you're dependent. This is who you are. It defines who you are and how you do. And everybody would ask you, what do you do? You know, the first thing that comes in your head is, I'm a great father. It should be, but it doesn't necessarily come out that way. So it's about who, what you do career-wise that can easily define you. And I think the work-life balance side for me was realizing over time, being grounded in family, being grounded spiritually meant a whole lot to me. And then I decided that, yes, there's going to be times where you're going to be reminded, put down the phone, but turn off the computer. And you better listen to that because that's happening at home, not necessarily at the office. So for me, the work-life balance was, and we always treated every company this way, family first, just unequivocally family first. Don't abuse it. Don't hide behind it, but tell us what's going on. If there's a family issue, we're always going to find grace for that. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it was, for me, balance was, all right, if you're doing the right things in the business world, then how do you really focus on being a parent? We could all read books on how to run companies and different theories of success, first time you become a parent, you're strangely absent in an instruction manual. And that's a lot of figuring it out. And you realize, the faster you realize how impressionable you are on your own children, the better parent you'll be. Luckily, I don't say that happened early enough for me, but it did happen. So proud of our girls and the uh, father that I was able to be while having to juggle all of this, but I enjoyed it. It's what, I, it's what drove me. I understood my internal hardwiring was to go do turnaround work, lead teams, but then the magic button of how to shut that off, never found it, but I tried. Did you let your family in on your work? I did, probably not as much as I should have, but yes, it's hard to go back, oh, how was your day? It's like your kids. I don't want to talk about the whole day, mom. <laughs> you, if you, Especially if you had a hard day, you're like, oh, I just want to moan about this more. But uh, yeah, I talked about it because under, again, a maturity issue is realizing it has an effect on home life. And once you realize that, you can talk about it and it's appreciated that you do. Absolutely. All right, Bill, we are going to shift into what I like to call lightning round. And so I'm going to ask you a series of quick questions or either ors, and you're just going to give me your gut. You ready? <laughs> okay. I suppose so. Okay. Beach or mountains? Mountains. Favorite thing to do on a Saturday? Fish. Last time you tried something new? This week. What'd you do? I realized that because I've been working so much, I didn't take good, trail- good care of my boat trailer, so I've been repairing it. Ah, very nice. How's that going for you? It's tedious. <laughs> YouTube. I've got some red knuckles to prove <laughs> I'm it. Sure. Okay, book you're reading now. Strength to Strength, by Arthur Brooks. Second oh. second time around. Very good. Resonates pretty well with me. And best book on leadership. Best book on leadership. I'd have to say Good to Great. Learned a lot from that book. Right people on the bus resonates and I don't people use that analogy all the time. Mhm. And it captures, I think, your career and being a turnaround guy, frankly, taking something that could be much better, maybe is good, taking it to great. You're not the first person to to use, to use have that same answer to that question. Okay, what time do you wake up? 6.20. What do you do first? I get up, make coffee, and read the news. All right, and this is the question that most really good journalists ask at, at the end of an interview, and that is... Bill, is there anything else you'd like to share with us today? I think this is a podcast around authentic leadership. I would encourage those to think about how to do that. And not necessarily to admire the people that do it, but the effect it has on a company and the effect it has on a team. It's just so clear, especially more, it's more clear today than I think it was 20 years ago, 25 years ago when I was kicking into the CEO roles. You just don't, the excitement, the talking down to people, the punching down, the kissing up. There's just so many bad traits out there that leave employees bewildered as to why am I here? What am I doing? And that's an awful place to be. So put yourself in their shoes. 
and say, what would I want out of this if I'm in their shoes? And you just want somebody you can trust. You want somebody that's credible. You want somebody that doesn't get overly excited because you're going to have times where it looks bad. And if you say it looks bad and we're going under, that isn't going to help the team. So how do you be the person that tempers that message but doesn't degrade the seriousness of it? So give them a way to find their own balance by not being the one that disrupts it yourself. The world needs more of your style of leadership, Bill. Thank you for this. It has been a pleasure, and I'm grateful for your time. I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. Thank you.